Probably good morning USA and uh, very good evening Sri Lanka. I'm Dr. Arvind Royban, a senior research scientist from the Ecoastronomy INC International Research Hub. And today I am the chief moderator of the ongoing webinar. Uh, in that case, I would like to give you a very small introduction about the, our guest speaker regarding the Ecoastronomy INC lecture series. So our today very special speaker is a solar physicist, dynamist, astrobiologist who has authored over 50 books as well as 400 scientific papers on astrobiology, extreme mobiles, diatoms, polar physics, astray, optics, and the meteorite. He holds 13 U.S. patents and was in 1992 a NASA innovator of the year. He was employed at the United States NASA Marshall Space Flight Center from 1966 to 2012, where he worked on astrophysics, lunar dust, and astrobiology. He's the one who established the astrobiology group at NASA. The very special person who's going to talk with us today was the director of the NASA MSFC Astrobiology Research Group, and he studied extreme mobiles, ice scales, Siberia, Antarctica, and microfossils, biomarkers, a pre-Cambrian rocks, and hibernaceous meteorites. He's a very unique person while we are talking about the speciations of the diatoms and the microfossilization. In fact, he has been discovered 13 species and six genera of the bacteria and fossils diatoms, cyanobacteria in polar anorganic meteorite in Sri Lanka. To be honest, I can say it's a living legend while we are talking about the life beyond the planet Earth. With that being said, I would like to invite very special guest speaker on today, Professor Richard Hoover, to address Equestromy INC International Platform. Professor Richard, now is your time. You can get started. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here with you today to uh, discuss the topic of biomolecules and life on Earth and in icy moons, comets, meteoroids, and asteroids. The question is where, how, and when did life originate? It has long been an accepted paradigm that life originated on the planet Earth by chemical reactions in the early atmosphere and oceans. This actually came about as a result of Stanley Miller and Harold Urey's experiment many, many years ago, in which they showed that you could produce a suite of amino acids by action of, of a primitive atmosphere with lightning uh, and volcanic type eruptions. And therefore it became widely accepted that since you could get the fundamental building blocks of life, which were thought to be just amino acids at that point in time, uh, that it was very straightforward that from there, you would have uh, the origin of the first protocells. And from that, by way of, of chemical and biological evolution, life on the planet. An alternate hypothesis was the panspermia hypothesis, which goes very far back to the work of Anaxagoras, uh, and then on up through Svantharenius, and then more recently uh, with the work of uh, of Sir Fred Hoyle and Chandra Vikramasinghe. That hypothesis is that life originated somewhere else in the universe and was transported to the early Earth. Uh, recent discoveries of complexity of life and biomolecules in comets and exoplanets uh, indicate that the panspermia model advanced by Sir Fred Hoyle and Professor Dr. Chandra Vikramasinghe may in fact be valid and that the accepted par paradigm may be ultimately overthrown. The origin of the stars, planets, and organics actually begins in, in cosmic space. Uh, this is an image from the James Webb stellar, uh, uh, Space Telescope of a stellar nursery. These are the cosmic cliffs of Carina Nebula. And in it, you're seeing the formation of stars and planets and there at the interface of the interstellar dust, you see these brilliantly shining stars and, and the very beginnings of planetary systems. 
I want to talk for a moment about elements. The chemical elements are formed with the, within these uh, stars. And one of the fascinating things is that uh, from the standpoint of elements, life is really quite simple. Uh, you can write a chemical formula for life, uh, C4H7O2N1. If you, then that gives you more than 98% of all cells. If you add P0.2 and SO.2, you're up to 99% of all cells. So basically we have 118 chemical elements in the periodic table, but only six of those make up essentially all of life. And, and in fact, the dominant chemical element is carbon. And as we see here, this is the cosmic abundance of the elements. And one of the things that is very interesting is if you look, you see that hydrogen is by far the most abundant element in the entire universe, followed by helium. Uh, and then the lithium, beryllium and boron are much less abundant. And then carbon is a peak that comes right up significantly above that. Well, one of the things that happened many, many years ago is around 1954, Sir Fred Hoyle was working on, on his uh, development of how the elements form within hot stars. And he realized that there was a significant problem because basically hydrogen fuses uh, with two hydrogen uh, nuclei fuse and that gives you an alpha particle or a helium nucleus. And then if you fuse a helium nucleus with a beryllium, you get a carbon carbon 12 and it immediately disintegrates well this puzzles Sir, Sir Fred Hoyle because he said wait a minute this is not possible I'm alive and I'm basically made out of carbon so how is it that the carbon is disintegrating and he found out that about uh, based on his research uh, approximately one out of every 2,500 carbon atoms that were formed would be in a stable resonant state in which you have a 7.7 .7 MeV helium beryllium resonance that forms the stable carbon 12. That came to be known as the Hoyle state, and that has been called the most outrageous prediction in the history of science. The astonishing thing is that when that resonance occurs, it, recent studies with uh, supercomputers and uh, synchrotrons have shown that in the, in the in unstable state, the alpha particles are actually like a bent arm where you have uh, three alpha particles sort of in a line with a slight angle at the end. And in the stable state, you have the three alpha particles at the apices of a triangle. Uh, this is a, a phenomenon that is occurring in super hot stars at a temperature of about 100 million degrees. Well. All of the living organisms that we know of require the coexistence of water, energy, and only 20 biogenic elements. Out of the 118, only 20 are absolutely essential. One of the fascinating things is that these very uh, these elements make simple compounds, uh, like, for example, alanine. And alanine is an amino acid, and you see on the right, that you have two variants, the L-alanine and the D-alanine. That actually was the phenomenon that was discovered by Pasteur when he was investigating uh, wine dregs. And he found that uh, uh, the wine dregs had the capability of rotating the plane of visible light. And in, in uh, looking at the crystals, he found that they were identical, except they were in two opposite uh, configurations. So they're mirror images, much like the gloves that you put on your hands. And if you try to put your left glove on your right hand, you know it doesn't fit. Well, here you see in the upper right, uh, the L-alanine and the D-alanine. The fascinating thing is that all living things are made out of homocural uh, amino acids and homocural sugars. And Pasteur stated homochorality is the signature of life. Well, that is intriguing because if you make these by Miller-Urey synthesis or by abiotic processes, you get mixtures in which you have equal amounts of the D and the L uh, 
uh, amino acids or sugars. And ultimately, uh, that is not suitable for life because if you tried to uh, to make a, a complex organic chemical and you put the wrong chirality in, in the place where the amino acid was supposed to go, it would make the morphology different. And so the protein or the enzyme or the, uh, or the DNA or RNA molecule would not function and would not be capable of being completed. If you take living things after they die, the amino acids start slowly disintegrating in which one type flips to the other. When you start out, you'll have 100% L-alanine and L-aspartic acid and so forth. And therefore, when they flip, you'll now have 99% of the L and 1% of the D. So you have a higher probability that the next one that's going to flip is going to be an L instead of a D until you get to equal amounts. And that's what's called a racemic mixture. Ancient amino acids are racemic. And by ancient, I mean millions of years old, not just thousands or hundreds of thousands of years old. Water is the absolute essential quantity for all life. It's because of its wonderful properties uh, of being a solvent for almost everything. Uh, the mass of all living cells is of the order of 70% water. So basically, we're made out of water and carbon. Water is the most abundant chemical compound in the universe in which you have uh, two elements joined together. It has this polar bent geometry in which the uh, bond angle is of the order of 104.5 degrees. And as a result of that, when water freezes, it expands. And uh, this has a lower density than liquid water. And as a result of that, the ice floats on the surface. That is absolutely wonderful because if water did not expand upon freezing, we wouldn't be alive because oceans would freeze from the bottom up rather than the uh, top down. Once you get this solid crust of, of water ice on top of the ocean or uh, of an ocean of an icy moon, it has a high albedo, meaning that it reflects most of the light back and the energy, and therefore it stays cold. Uh, and it also has the ability to insulate. Uh, and this very cold crust of ice on icy moons and icy planets sublimes very slowly in which the ice goes directly from uh, from uh, ice into gas. Uh, and as a result of that, icy moons do not lose their water ice uh, extremely rapidly. There is a fascinating point, and that is that the maximum density of water, if it is fresh water, the maximum density is at plus 3.4 degrees Celsius. And if it's salt water, it's at minus three degrees Celsius. Well, when you look in the oceans, you only have to go about 500 meters down until you've reached that temperature. And that means that from there, all the way to the bottom of the Marianas Trench or however deep the ocean happens to be, the temperature is exactly the same. And the same is true of deep lakes, uh, freshwater lakes. Uh, uh, so the interesting aspect of this is that all deep oceans and all deep lakes everywhere in the universe are essentially alike. They are zero degrees C plus or minus about three and a half, which means that living organisms in these regimes have remained at those temperatures ever since the formation of oceans on the planet Earth or the formation of oceans on Europa or Enceladus or Pluto or any other moon or planet anywhere in the entire universe. Well, as a result of that, uh, that means that you could take biology from the bottom of the Pacific and plunge it through the ice of Pluto, and it would find an ocean that would be almost identical to what it left. The scientific community uh, has been searching for what they call habitable exoplanets. Uh, these are considered to be Earth-like planets or moons in the circumstellar habitable zone. Well, they plot out this zone as an optimistic habitable zone or a conservative habitable zone. And 
they are using parameters uh, in which the assumption is made that Earth is the basic uh, model for which all life must respond. Uh, and so you look at this chart and it shows the uh, the amount of sunlight that's received on the planet as compared to the sunlight on planet Earth. And that's one of the parameters that's used for, uh, to determine what they consider to be optimistic or conservative habitable zones. The problem with that is that you don't need light for life. You don't need even surface water oceans uh, for living organisms, because we know now that there is life deep within the crust of the earth that's living in, in thin cracks and tiny bugs in which water has been produced by radiogenic elements. And in fact, you could have planets that have no water oceans at all that could still have microbial life. The ocean worlds of our solar system are most interesting. Uh, the most extensively studied from the standpoint of astrobiology are Europa and Enceladus, although there are many, many other ocean moons, uh, 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 the ocean worlds uh, that would be capable of supporting life. One of the intriguing things about both Europa and Enceladus is that they have cracks and and water is streaming out from those cracks, carrying with it organics and dust. Uh, here are models showing uh, that Europa has a, a uh, solid uh, metallic crust with a rocky mantle and then a liquid water ocean overlain by an icy crust. Uh, Enceladus is somewhat similar, but the Pluto has a very, very thick uh, icy crust and a very thick liquid water ocean. Now, the hypothesis that's been held for a long time as to the formation of these oceans is tidal heating because as the moon sur uh, passes around Jupiter or, or Saturn, the tidal forces are going to be pushing and pulling on the ice, and that will introduce heat into the ice and cause the melting of the lower layers of the ice. Well, there is a significant problem. We have strong evidence that there is a vast uh, four and a half billion year old subcrustal ocean based on New Horizons data on Pluto. Well, there's a problem because Pluto is a tiny planet far, far away from the sun. So it's receiving extremely low levels of sunlight. And the problem is, where is the gas giant that is pushing and pulling on the icy crust of Pluto? Well, there isn't any. So the question then is, how is it that Pluto has this water ocean? And I will present what I'm going to show as evidence that the radiogenic heating from long-lived uh, heat producing elements as they're called and they're very extensively studied on earth we know know a great deal about the heat producing elements the primary ones being potassium uranium and thorium although there is some energy from rubidium and a few other radiogenic elements but these are very very long-lived elements that uh, are continuing to produce uh, heat into the lower layers of our own oceans and, and in fact may be responsible for much of the magma uh, that is associated with volcanoes. The icy moon of Jupiter, Europa, if we look at it with the telescopes you see here in the left, the Minos Linnea region, and this color image shows very beautifully uh, how, uh, how the deep reds and blues and whites are shown there. The white gives you a good, good evidence of, uh, of the proper color balance, but you see bright reds. In the upper right, there are str red stromatolites found under Lake Untersee that we explored in Antarctica in 2008 and 2009. And diatoms have this color of golden brown, which is shown in the center picture. So uh, many years ago, we wrote a paper in which we presented the hypothesis that the colors of, of Europa uh, are actually caused by diatoms and other uh, other kinds of algae. The lower left is 
snow algae, Schlamydomonas nivalis that I, I collected in North Siberia. Every every day I would go to my uh, my, I, my snow bank and study the uh, snow algae that was living there. Well, these have these interesting pigments and that gives rise to these beautiful colorations. The Europa Clipper mission was planned to study uh, life being ejected from Europa and Enceladus. And uh, there were, uh, Klenner et al. did a paper in which they showed how you could identify cell material in a single grain of ice emitted by uh, Europa or Enceladus. Cassini uh, discovered that Titan has abundant methane in the atmosphere and a salty subcrustal ocean. And Tr uh, Voyager 2 uh, found that Triton also has a subcrustal ocean, a silicate core uh, on Triton. It is not essential that the energy for life comes from sunlight. Uh, these are organisms that use photosynthesis. They're called phototrophs, but there are a lot of other organisms. Uh, that eat food, eat the uh, organic matter produced by phototrophs. Um, and then there are others that are chemotrophs and lithotrophs. The, the chemotrophs are capable of living just strictly on chemicals. For example, they can utilize nothing but hydrogen or iron or sulfur. And the lithotrophs uh, derive this material from rocks. So they're rock eaters. The hydrolysis of ATP and ADP provides the energy that's needed to drive the protein-based molecular motors. ATP is essential to all forms of life, but sunlight and free oxygen are not essential. There are now known hydrotrophic microorganisms that live in deep crustal rocks, and it's fascinating that diatoms are capable of living not only in the deep dark ocean layers, but they also remain alive during the period of time in Antarctica when it gets nighttime and in Antarctica it gets serious about night. It stays dark for many months and when it is dark at night, these diatoms that are living in the Antarctic ice, they say, well, it's dark, we can't do photosynthesis, so let's eat. <laughs> and so they start consuming organic matter by uh, utilizing material that has been released from dead life forms and they can consume uh, different types of amino acids directly. But most intriguingly, as we pointed out in our 1986 paper, they can also consume alpha amino isobutyric acid, also known as AIB. Well, AIB is rare on Earth, but it is abundant on the carbonaceous meteorites. and Therefore, one has to ask, where did diatoms get a taste for AIB? Well, I will suggest to you that they got the taste for AIB because they actually previously lived on comets and the carbonaceous meteorites that we have, the CI and CM meteorites, uh, are most probably the remains of comets. Did Earth life originate on the planet Earth? Well. The antiquity of life is very interesting to address this problem. Uh, there's good evidence that the solar system formed about four and a half billion years ago, and that life appeared somewhere between 3.8 and 4.2 billion years ago. Well, at the time that the Earth formed in the Hadean period, it was basically molten, so much, much too hot for living organisms. But it cooled enough to allow liquid water oceans at about 4.2 billion years ago. Sharov did an interesting study in 2006 in which they looked, used the complexity of, of, uh, of um, the complexity of the genome as a clock to examine the, uh, the possibility of when life on Earth might originate. And if you look here at this plot, starting with the uh, mammals, humans, and, and other uh, mammalian animals, and going to fish and worms, back through eukaryotic, uh, uh, back to eukaryotic organisms, and then the bacteria and archaea, the prokaryotes, you find that this line crosses the point at which the solar system originated around four, four and a half billion years ago. And if you extrapolate it backward, it crosses the axis somewhere between nine and 10 billion years ago. That suggests that life that we have on Earth 
may have originated as much as nine or more billion years ago. Well, at that point in time, there was no solar system. The other thing that is a problem with the endogenous origin of life theory is that simple cells just simply do not exist. The idea that they had was that these amino acids would uh, form within membranes and, and you would get what were called protocells and they would ultimately evolve into modern cells. Uh, well, this is, this is an intriguing problem because uh, if we look at bacterial flagellar motor, as shown here with the commutators and, and uh, rotors, stators, and all of the various components you see in this image, transmission electron microscope image, uh, you see the uh, nanomachine, which is the motor of the flagellum of an E. coli. And there, there are the various genes that operate this nanomachine. Uh, this motor has all the characteristics of the motor that you would have in your fan. The only problem is it's 40 nanometers in diameter. And the other interesting point is that some 4.3 or 4.3 billion years before Westinghouse and Tesla did their work in developing electrical motors, the bacteria on the planet Earth were happily building nanomachines of electrical motors that work by utilizing electrons direct, directly and are capable of continuing to function and, and operate in these various organisms for enormous periods of time, continuing to be rebuilt whenever the motor wears out. If NASA were given the task of building a bacterial uh, motor, an electrical motor on the size that it could be used within uh, microorganisms, uh, it would not have sufficient funds to uh, execute this task if we had sufficient time to actually accomplish it. The evidence is that life appeared on Earth uh, about 4.2 billion years ago, and that's from <clears throat> carbon isotopes and fossils of filaments in hydrothermal vent rocks. The fundamental question is, what is life? A lot of people say, well, we really can't define it. Well, I disagree. <clears throat> I think we can get a good idea of a way of defining life. Basically, in living organisms, you have chemical complexity, metabolism, and in many cases, motility that distinguish living from non-living cells. The complex metabolic pathways are controlled by DNA and RNA, and they're used for the extraction of energy and chemical elements from the environment, directly transporting it and assembling it to these extremely complex biomolecules, organelle, organelles, cells, and living, motile, unicellular or multicellular organisms. All metabolism and locomotion ceases at death, and Metabolism and locomotion does not exist in abiotic chemical compounds and rocks, minerals, crystals are dead biological cells. If you think about it, <clears throat> if, a, if a, you have two dogs and they're identical and one of them dies and they're lying side by side <clears throat> from the standpoint of chemistry, they are absolutely identical. But from the standpoint of biology, they are colossally different because one is no longer capable of carrying out metabolism. It is no longer capable of jumping up and running across the yard. <clears throat> there's, there's a uh, problem with the, uh, the, the hypothesis, the idea of biomarkers has been used in astrobiology for a long time to talk about where you can get evidence of possible life. Well, biomarkers are typically used by geologists to look for life in ancient terrestrial rocks. Uh, and you can find simple racemic organics uh, in the rocks or the atmosphere, uh, like, uh, uh, like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, racemic amino acids, methanes, and alcohols uh, that can be produced by biology. But the problem with these things that are called biomarkers is they can also be produced by non-biological uh, origins. Biomolecules are totally different. 
you have here complex homocural organic molecules that are very complex that can only be produced by these metabolic pathways within living organisms. They include things like DNA and RNA, nucleic acids, uh, pure amino acids, uh, uh, dimethyl sulfide, uh, uh, carboxylic acids, uh, enzymes, and proteins as an example. Those are phenomenally complex kinds of forms. Another biomarker that has uh, been used is uh, isotopic fractionation because carbon, stable carbon uh, isotopes fractionate and because during living, during life, organisms prefer carbon-12 to carbon-13, which are both stable forms of carbon. And as a result of that, when grass or trees uh, carry out photosynthesis, they select the carbon-12 over the carbon-13, and so they get lighter in terms of uh, compared with abiotic uh, carbonate rocks. And then when a cow comes along and eats the grass, it again selects the carbon-12 over the carbon-13. So the carbon in, in their cells become lighter and so on until you get down to methanogens, which are the microorganisms that eat methane. And they become very, very uh, highly in, uh, uh, high concentrations of carbon-12. So significantly lower what is called the DEL-13C. And Gallimol plotted the different amino acids from several different things like Gracilaria and Chlorella euclina. And, and he showed on his chart here that the DEL13C went from about minus four to about minus 24. But he also found that those amino acids were in the same relative position, uh, except on Murchison meteorite, except that the DEL13C went from a very heavy carbon as you find in in the meteorite from about plus 45 to about plus 20. So you saw the same kind of uh, fractionation that you have in biology, but it was on the meteorite. Uh, when academician Gallimaud first showed me this, uh, I looked at him and I said, that is the best uh, isotopic evidence that I have ever seen for the existence of extraterrestrial life. He looked at me and he said, well, I guess I can understand how you might interpret it that way. <laughs> the problem was this chart that he was showing me was from his own book entitled The Biological Fractionation of Stable Isotopes. Academician Gallimaud was very skeptical of our work on microfossils and meteorites for many, many years until he finally, we, when we discovered diatoms in the Orgay meteorite uh, and I invited Academician Gallimaud he came there and spent a couple of days working with me. And he finally, as we were going back to Moscow, he said, well, I'm finally convinced that there are indigenous microfossils in the carbonaceous meteorites. That took over a decade of work for me to finally get him convinced of that point. Comets contain water and organics. In the center, you're seeing a the comet 9P Temple 1 the flashings are occurring as a result of, of the comet erupting and breaking, uh, uh, causing ISIS to be thrown away. Uh, and that's, that's out beyond the orbit of Mars. And it was caused only by the sunlight falling on, on the dark crust and heating the comet. And uh, uh, as a result of that, the water beneath the ice is melt and then the water uh, vaporizes and puts pressure on the icy crust. Here in the left is Sunshine et al.'s data on 9P Temple 1, and you can see that the, uh, the portion of the black crust that's illuminated by the sun, even beyond the orbit of, uh, of, uh, of Mar uh, Mars, was in fact uh, to a temperature of around 330 degrees, uh, 330 Kelvin. Uh, the lower region is in the 200 and 70 to 290 Kelvin regime and 273 Kelvin is zero degrees C, which is a magic temperature. It's the temperature at which uh, ice becomes liquid. Uh, methane, methyl, methyl alcohol, formaldehyde, acetylene, and ethane have all been detected on 9P Temple 1. Uh, this, is, this is the work of, of uh, 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 Professor Simonia. Uh, at uh, Ilya State University in Tbilisi, Georgia, uh, along with Dale Crickshank at JPL. 
and they looked at unidentified spectral lines in comets and they found that uh, that many comets had very very intriguing extremely precise spectral lines that match the spectrum of luciferase and certain other other complex organic uh, enzymes and pigments uh, here in the upper right you see the luciferase gene and it has seven e end, uh, exons that code for 547 amino acids over 1976 base pairs of genomic DNA. The fascinating point is that this luciferase uh, enzyme is found in fireflies, but it's also found in, in the uh, luminescent uh, bacteria and worms and, and fish that inhabit the deep dark oceans. But it's made out of 547 amino acids as shown in this ribbon, uh, molecule, uh, ribbon model at the top. And every one of those amino acids has to be exactly the right amino acid and in exactly the right place or you don't get this topology and you don't get that enzyme. Now, you've got 547. At place one, you select, uh, say, proline. At place B, place two, uh, aspartic acid and place three, uh, glutamic acid and so forth. But each one of those has to be the correct one of 20. So the probability of getting one luciferase gene correct is one divided by 20 to the power of 547, which is indeed a very, very small number. The dimethyl sulfide is also a very interesting compound. It was recently found on Comet 67P cherimov gerasimenko It's been found in the uh, uh, Ryugu asteroid and in the Orge meteorite. Uh, the uh, comet image that we show here it no, not only has smooth blue uh, ice and jets, but also very interesting colors of red and, and blue green that are suggestive of diatoms and cyanobacteria. Uh, 67 PCG is also found to have DMS and molecular oxygen. Uh, and uh, this is suggestive of active growth of diatoms and cyanobacteria. Here is the James Webb Space Telescope data on methane and the biomolecule dimethyl sulfide on exoplanet K218b. Over in the right, you see uh, uh, methane and dimethyl sulfide, and then far right, carbon dioxide and dimethyl sulfide. Dimethyl sulfide is the, uh, plays a major role in the global carbon cycle, uh, I'm sorry, the global sulfur cycle. It is what is responsible for the aroma of the sea. Uh, in fact, it, uh, it's formed in enormous uh, quantities in the polar oceans, so where you have lots and lots of diatoms and cyanobacteria. And basically, they form the dimethyl sulfonyl propionate DMSP, which then is bacterially degraded to dimethyl sulfide. Here, we see the various kinds of organisms in, in oceans that produce dimethyl sulfide. Now, dimethyl sulfide is not produced by non-biological mechanisms whatsoever. In this lower portion on the right side, you see the different diatoms uh, and that are produced uh, that produce DMS up in the top, the dinoflagellates, and uh, over in the far left corner are the cyanobacteria. Well, one of the intriguing things is you see Microcolius thonoplastes, Lingbia, uh, and and in the bottom of the diatoms you see Melisera and Nitia and so forth. Well, those are in fact intriguing because they're the same kind of of diatoms and cyanobacteria that we found in the Polonarua, the Orgay, the Murchison, and many other carbonaceous meteorites. <clears throat> DNA has this incredible double helix with four nucleobases, adenine pairs with thymine and guanine pairs with cytosine, and they're attached to this deoxyribose sugar and phosphate backbone. The human genome has about three billion base pairs, whereas cyanobacteria have three and a half million base pairs. The intriguing thing is that the uh, uh, guanine always pairs with cytosine in, in all living organisms, in, and that is in all of the DNA and the RNA molecules. So, in fact, because of that, 
guanine should be exactly equal to cytosine in any living or any recently dead organism. One of the other complex biomolecules that is very intriguing to me is this erythidine 5 prime phosphate decarboxylase. OMP is actually responsible for the biosynthesis of uridine, cytidine, and thymidine, which are critical for the formation of DNA and essential for life. You simply do not have life without DNA. Well, it turns out that if you try to form, uh, uh, to form those, um, to synthesize those very complex and life critical important molecules in water, the half-life of the synthesis is of the order of 78 million years. Well, if you're trying to make DNA and in order for it to replicate, you got to wait around 78 million years to get some more, you're not going to have anything alive. But the reason things are alive is because OMP is a catalyst and it changes this time from 78 million years to less than 18 milliseconds. Now a DNA molecule can replicate, but it takes 270 amino acids to make an OMP molecule. And so the probability of getting one amino, a one OMP molecule is one divided by 20 to the 270th power. The longest and, and greatest molecule in our body and in all cells actually is the Titan molecule, which is the spring molecule. It's why your heart beats, it's why your lungs work, it's why we're able to talk or walk. It's why cells are able to move, they're able to, uh, to do their functions of transporting things across the cell boundary. But Titan contains 34,350 amino acids so to get one Titan molecule, you require a probability of one divided by 20 to the 34,350th power, which is another way of writing absolute zero. The complexity of these biomolecules suggests that life did not happen by accident. It did not form by an, an abiogenic endogenous operation very quickly after the earth cooled and that suggests that it either occurred in much more ancient star systems or uh, it, it occurred as a result of divine intervention. I just wanted to show you the uh, metabolic pathways, the major metabolic pathways of life. And you see the pathway for carbon fixation and photorespiration and pentose phosphate pathway. And down in the middle lower in orange is the citric acid uh, cycle or the Krebs cycle, Krebs cycle. Well, what you're looking at is a picture of life itself. Uh, there won't be a quiz on this because <laughs> it's take you a while to memorize this plot, but it shows how amazingly complicated every living cell is. And here is a representation of the uh, citric acid cycle itself. And those are the biochemical reactions that release energy stored in nutrients by the oxidation of acetyl-CoA that has been derived from fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. And you see how this, this one uh, chemical goes through these various stages to ultimately become the, uh, the product chemical that is being formed by way of this biochemical reaction. This shows you the amazing complexity of living things, and that occurs in, in all cells. <clears throat> Cyanobacteria first appeared on Earth some three and a half billion years ago, and they played a crucial role in the oxygenation of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the, it was originally believed that they were exclusively aquatic, uh, phototrophic, uh, photoautotrophic organisms, uh, the blue-green algae, um, and uh, Calithrix and Microcoleus live in deep uh, rocks in uh, Rio Tinto, and this results in a paradigm shift. Light is absolutely not needed for life. This is an example of locomotion in the rotifer, and you have also the cells appearing in, uh, in the uh, uh, cyanobacteria. This is locomotion of Spirochaeta americana that we discovered and described from Mono Lake. Beautiful, beautiful little spiral uh, microorganisms swimming along. 
And this is locomotion in tube dwelling diatoms. And uh, uh, you see the diatoms swimming within the tube. There's one little guy here that somehow got lost and he's running around trying to find his way, but he, he can't find out how to get back in the tube that he escaped from. Diatoms are among the most intricate and beautiful cells on, on Earth. They build these beautiful shells of silica and uh, they're called the grasses of the sea, most abundant uh, plants in the oceans. Um, and this is a picture, an image from the Muller uh, type uh, slide of uh, Jeremy Haiti that I published in my National Geographic article in 1979. You can see the incredible beauty. These are not just beautiful plants, they're the most abundant plants in the polar ice and oceans, uh, also called the grasses of the sea. They produce more than 20% of the oxygen for our atmosphere, and they're the base of the entire marine food chain. So without diatoms, uh, you wouldn't have, uh, have the wonderful fish and whales and, and so forth. In fact, it's intriguing. The great blue whales, largest animals on earth, eat huge quantities of diatoms as they push the water out through their baleen, and then they scrape the slime of diatoms and dinoflagellates off the baleen before they open their mouth to take another gigantic gulp of water to be able to push it out through their filter. In 1976, I had the honor of doing the inventory of the Henri Van Herc diatom collection at the Van Herc Museum for the Royal Society of Zoology of Antwerp. And in 1986, I had the honor of doing a collaboration with Sir Fred Hoyle and John Roy Tromasing on the possibility that diatoms might exist in interstellar dust, comets, and Europa. Uh, and one of the intriguing things here, this, this was cosmonaut Solovyev, who, when they were cleaning the outside of the ISS window because it had gotten to where the transmissivity had dropped dramatically, when they brought the cleanings back in and looked at them on the ISS, they found in the upper left, you can see this pale blue image showing diatoms and uh, or a diatom and desmids. And the center picture is a, a similar diatom. This is a terrestrial image uh, and it's a diatom known as Cymbella. Well, that report uh, of marine plankton on the outside of the window caused a lot of controversy, uh, even though the uh, the ISS had been in orbit uh, since 1998 and this was 2000. 14, so for 16 years. And the reason they went out to clean the window was because it was getting to the point that they weren't getting high transmissivity. And when they did their cleanings, they found, lo and behold, the outside of the window had diatoms and desmids. Uh, this, was re this was rejected and it was argued that either these were carried up from ocean currents. Well, getting all the way up to the International Space Station from the ocean is a bit of a task. Uh, and then colliding and sticking on the rapidly moving ISS is an even bigger task. Uh, but ultimately, the scientific community knew that this was impossible and therefore it was rejected. Although it would not be impossible if the ISS periodically goes through the tail of a comet that's spewing off cometary material containing diatom and desmids. In 1985, I received a phone call with a very strong British voice wanting to talk to me about diatoms, and then he announced that his name was Fred Hoyle. Well, I was totally shocked because Fred Hoyle was my childhood hero. I had written, read many of his, of his books. He wrote a great number of science fiction books, and, uh, and uh, he was the, the uh, proponent of the steady state theory of the origin of the universe, and he was the one that, that coined the phrase, the Big Bang, uh, because he was trying to ridicule the Big Bang Theory that was uh, uh, the opponent of the steady state theory. Well, he wanted to talk to me to talk about diatoms. And he, when he found out I was an X-ray astronomer, he invited me to join him on this collaborative study of, uh, uh, of diatoms and interstellar dust. And it took me a couple of nanoseconds to decide that that was something I would very much like to do. So Fred Hoyle and I went to the Naval Research Laboratory and we, well, he came here with Lady Barbara and, and after we spent a week and a half at my home and he gave lectures at the Marshall Space Flight Center, we then went to the Naval Research Laboratory in, outside of Washington and we measured the spectra of diatoms, which you see in the upper right. And, and that is, is a measurement of diatom spectra shown in the solid line compared with the astronomical data 
obtained on the infrared flux between 8 and 32 microns from the trapezium nebula at 175 Kelvin. Uh, the bottom image shows the infrared flux between 3 and 12 microns of a galactic center source, which we now know is a black hole called GCIRS-7. And you see all the nice little bumps and wiggles in this image are beautifully matched by this solid line uh, of the diatoms. And at the end of the paper, we concluded that this indicated that it supported the concept of a cosmic microbiological system in which diatoms or similar microorganisms might exist on comets, Europa, or in interstellar space. The reason for this important uh, dis distinction is that inorganic silicates have a sharp peak at 8.7 and 12.7 microns, and diatoms are, are biologically produced silica, orthosilicic acid, that has been laid down one molecule at a time on a protein template, and it does not have this kind of, of spectral response uh, characteristics, and that is is the reason that these curves match so nicely. Now, there are other organisms like radiolaria and silicoflagellates and uh, arenaceous foraminifera and so forth that also make silica that is very similar to diatom silica. But this silica, that, that this uh, uh, orthosilicic acid type silica is made by biology. So it doesn't matter whether it's diatoms or, or uh, radiolaria. Uh, it's still an indication of biology associated with interstellar dust. The first studies of organics in, in microfossils began all the way back in 1834 when Berzelius found water and organics in the LA meteorite and suggested it was evidence for the existence of extraterrestrial life. In 64, Pisani and Klotz detected carbon, water, and organics similar to coal in the Orge meteorite and they made the fascinating discovery that the Orgea meteorite disintegrated in water. That means that if it had ever fallen in a pool of water, if it had been rained on, it would not be in existence because it would have converted into a pile of black mush. In 1962, George Klaus and Bartholomew Nagy stunned the world when they reported the discovery of possible micro, microorganisms in, in the Orgea and Ivuna meteorites. Well, that caused a huge controversy, a very big debate, and ultimately uh, Anders and Fitch won the debate by claiming that they had found a piece of orgay that was intentionally uh, contaminated. Before that, uh, the uh, scientist by the name of Palik, the great uh, uh, microbiologist, did studies of orgay, and she drew the drawing up at the top of what she considered to be blue-green algae that she had found in the in the meteorite. And of course, blue-green algae are also known as cyanobacteria. And in 1996, David McKay announced the discovery of nanofossils in ALH84001. And at that point in time, I started a study of, of um, microscopy of, uh, of the meteorites and uh, found out that Alexei Rosanov uh, of the Russian Academy of Sciences had been doing something very, very similar, in fact, identical, but it was being done independently and he found very similar things to what I had been finding. This is a, an image of Nagi and, and, uh, uh, and Nagi and Yuri in, in his laboratory where he was experimenting with the mechanisms for formation of, of amino acids and also with the, uh, the uh, uh, organized elements that he was finding within the meteorite. Uh, in 1967, Sam Van Landingham produced this transmission electron microscope image of, of, of what he called electron dense bodies in the Orge uh, filaments that he shows here. And you see these little black dots along the longitudinal axis of that filament. Well, here's a picture that we obtained of, uh, of Rhodosudomonas rutilis that was given to me in 1997 by Weinstein in the uh, the Institute of Microbiology of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and we see the same kind of little black dots, uh, electron-dense solid bodies. Well, it turns out the organism that he gave me was Rhodosudomonas rutilis, which is a magnetotactic purple sulfur bacteria. 
And here we see the same kind of things in the filament that was found by Tan and Van Landingham in 1967. Those are the magnetosomes that the magnetotactic bacteria uses to detect the Earth's magnetic field. At the time Tan and Van Landingham made their discovery, no human being on the planet Earth had any idea whatsoever that magnetotactic bacteria existed on Earth. And here they found evidence for magnetotactic bacteria in the Orge meteorite. McKay reported the discovery of pods and, and magnetites and possible microfossils in the uh, Mars meteorite ALH8401. Those results were dismissed by many scientists as being either abiotic minerals or coating artifacts. But at the time this announcement was made, I said, well, gee, I had read a long time ago and actually written in the article with Fred Hoyle about microfossils in the, in the uh, Orge meteorite. And all of a sudden I realized that I was basing this based entirely on, on what I had read previously. And I decided, well, I think I ought to take a look and see if there really are things there. And so I got a sample of Orge, uh, I'm sorry, of Murchison uh, from uh, a meteorite dealer. And I started looking at it with the scanning electron microscope we had here at Marshall. Uh, we were using an environmental scanning electron microscope, the one you see with Alexei Rosanoff in the upper left, which is now a very much an old antique. Of course, Alexei is almost an antique because he's approaching 90 years old now. <laughs> I just spoke with him. He was in Siberia. <laughs> he's continuing to do research. Uh, but uh, in the uh, center two images at the top, you have fossils of cyanobacteria in the Murchison meteorite and in the, uh, the Hoopsagul phosphorites. And they're the very same morphology and same size uh, as these, uh, uh, these filaments as cyanobacteria in the phosphorites. The lower left two images are Alexi's images from the meteorite. Murchison and the lower right is my image from uh, one of my images from Murchison. We did collaboration then starting in 1998. I formed the NASA Virtual Astrobiology Institute at Marshall and the Astrobiology Laboratory here and started doing scanning electron microscopy of fossils in ancient rocks and meteorites. And Alexi and I published our Atlas of Microorganisms in the Ancient Phosphorites of Hoopsagul, Mongolia. These are the kind of meteorites that I have studied. This is actually an incomplete list. I've added about another 20 meteorites to this list. Ones in green show abundant, uh, abundant biomolecules and microfossils. Ones in yellow, you can still find microfossils, but they're rare. And in, uh, in, black, in red, they're, they've never been detected at all. <laughs> the study is done very simply. Take the sample, fracture it, put it on a stub with the fr freshly fractured surface up and put it in a scanning electron microscope. Uh, the upper right is the uh, uh, Mia Triglev uh, TESCON instrument that we have at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. And the lower right is the TESCON Vega-3 at the Joint Institute of Nuclear Research in Laboratory for Radiation Biology in Dubna, Russia. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to go to Russia because of the conflict, but hopefully that will be resolved and I'll be able to return because uh, there's a nice interest in it there and we, we have been doing some very, very exciting research. The Orge, Murchison and Polonrua meteorites, I think should be considered the Rosetta Stones of life in the universe. Orge fell in France in 1864, May 14 at 8 p.m. Murchison fell in, in Australia uh, at 10.59 a.m. on the 18th of September, 1969. And the Polonarua stones fell in, in Polonarua district of Sri Lanka, the areas of, of Aralag and Willow, Ratkenda and Garandura Kote uh, at 6.39 p.m. on the 29th of December, 2012. In Murchison, uh, Martin showed the existence of extraterrestrial nucleobases. She was able to prove they were extraterrestrial by the measurements of, of the uh, nitrogen and carbon isotopes. Um, but the fascinating point is that, uh, that cytosine and thymine 
have never been detected in the carbonaceous meteorites. Well, I shouldn't say that. There was a very recent study that detected traces of cytosine. Um, but uh, the fascinating point is that cytosine degrades to uracil with a half-life of 17,000 years and thymine degrades to xanthine with a half-life of 1.3 million years. Uracil and xanthine are present in all the carbonaceous meteorites as well as the other nucleobases. So the, the intriguing uh, aspect of this is it suggests that biology was present in the Murchison meteorite, but it died many millions of years ago. And the, um, the uh, nucleobases that were once there have d disintegrated, except for those that have very great stability. This shows the phosphorite of Hoopsagul with a microfossil similar to uh, uh, Siphonophicus. That's the name it's called now in the, in the upper, in the left. You see a similar kind of fossil, uh, which was previously, well, and still is, for living organisms called formidium. This shows Microcoleus thonoplastes in, embedded in the uh, in in the uh, Murchison meteorite, and Murchison has been found to contain evidence of, of Microcoleus thonoplastes and Nostalk. The images on the right show carbon. Uh, oxygen, iron, nickel, uh, sulfur maps, 2D X-ray maps, and you see the the carbon is very, very abundant in the uh, glycocalyx uh, of this um, of this organism. This is the cyanobacteria of the order Nostocalis in the Murchison meteorite, and in the lower left of the image, you see two escaped hormogonia, which are the mechanism that it uses for rep replication, and there is the uh, Hormogonium with an X, and when we measure that, uh, we find that the uh, oxygen-carbon ratio is is uh, uh, 14 or 16 percent to uh, 42 percent. But between them, there is no peak of nitrogen, which means that this this Hormogonium, even though it is carbonaceous, uh, represents biology that died millions of years ago, and the Murchison meteorite landed on Earth in 1969. Now, this is a woolly mammoth hair that I collected in Siberia, and we use this for the purpose of trying to answer this question of how long does nitrogen remain in biological materials as, as determined by the scanning electron microscope. And the little bright square in the center of this filament on the left is where the beam scanned it. Uh, again, it's uncoated. And here we see 73% of carbon, 13.6 of oxygen, 11.6 uh, of nitrogen. You can see in the right, this very dis definitive sharp nitrogen peak between the carbon and the oxygen. Well, the carbon oxygen ratio is anomalous. Um, it, it, instead of it being twice as much carbon, uh, uh, twice as much oxygen as you have, uh, twice as much carbon as in, present in the oxygen, it's significantly more than that. But this particular uh, filament is from a uh, an ancient uh, uh, woolly mammoth hair, but even though it's of the order of 32,000 years old, it still has significant levels of nitrogen. And that I don't know exactly when the nitrogen becomes undetectable. I suspect it's somewhere in the range of, of a few hundred thousand to a few million years. In the meteorites in the lower left, you see the nitrogen content below uh, 0.5 percent. When we couldn't detect it, I designated 0.5 percent as the level because I know that we can detect 0.5 percent nitrogen. Uh, in the uh, far right, you see the nitrogen levels from fungi that was a contaminant on one of the meteorite pieces from uh, many, many different things like uh, Egyptian mummies and a, a soldier that died in the Civil War. And, and on the far right are ancient fossils of cyanobacteria and trilobites, and they were terrestrial cyanobacteria and terrestrial trilobites, but they contain no detectable levels of, of nitrogen. Here in the bottom of the image, we see a piece of the Orgay meteorite and I'm getting ready to drop a drop of water on it and you will see it begin to disintegrate. Uh, 
And, and actually that's because the Orgame meteorite is basically a bunch of uh, particulates that are cemented together by magnesium sulfates, known as uh, uh, epsomite. And when the Orge fell in 1864, there was a great fireball and thunderous explosions. Villagers across the region of Southern France were absolutely terrified. They thought the world was coming to an end. And then these jet black stones started raining down in an eight by 14 kilometer scatter ellipse around Orge, Campsas, and Noic in tarn et in Southern France. The radiant uh, made it possible to determine the, the to orbital trajectory, and that has led to the conclusion that the Orge meteorite is probably from a Halley type or Jupiter family comet, uh, and liquid water exist existed on the parent body as recently as 10, 10 million years ago. It's chemically pristine, and it has elemental abundances similar to the photosphere of the sun. It's an extremely rare CI1 meteorite, of which we only have 10 CI1 carbonaceous chondrites, and it shows extensive alteration on the parent body by liquid water. The cosmic dust particles are basically cemented together by, by epsomite and other water-soluble salts. Uh, there's Bolstrom and Fredrickson showed that it was basically a, a brecciated bituminous clay. Stanislav Klotz reported that the stones were black and friable and easily cut by a knife. Uh, and it, uh, the analysis, uh, chemical analysis, showed that it contained a coal-like carrageen, which has very similar properties to lignite coal, and not dramatically different from the elemental properties of living bacteria. These are the minerals that have been found in Orgay, Montmorillonite clay is one of the most abundant to chloride and so forth. Here is a, ma a mat in Orgay. Uh, where you see lots of different filaments of, of cyanobacteria. This is Calithrix. Uh, Calithrix has this uh, structure at the bottom. You see this round, smooth structure. Calithrix is a nitrogen-fixing cyanobacterium, and it takes in nitrogen from, from the atmosphere, which is in the form of the NO2 molecule. Well, fortunately for us, the NO2 molecule is joined together by uh, a very strong triple bond. Uh, I'm sorry, the N N2 molecule is joined together by a very strong pr triple bond. And that means that nitrogen doesn't catch on fire, which is good because if it did, our atmosphere would be very dangerous. <laughs> the way that the nitrogen is broken apart is by enzymes like the, uh, the nitrogenase enzyme. But the nitrogenase enzyme is poisoned by oxygen and the cyanobacterium is carrying out photosynthesis, taking in carbon dioxide and breaking it apart, using the carbon for its organic matter and using the oxygen for respiration and the oxygen that's not needed, it dumps back into the atmosphere. So that's where a lot of our oxygen comes from, from the photosynthesis of cyanobacteria and diatoms. In fact, the bulk of it comes from those two organisms. But nitrogenase is poisoned by oxygen. So these kinds of organisms have built a very interesting way of re resolving that problem. They build an egg-like shell that is impervious to oxygen and they keep their nitrogenase enzymes in that shell that you see at the base. And therefore it is, is capable of, of carrying out the nitrogen fixing. And that then makes it possible for uh, there to be nitrates and nitrites that are, of course, essential for living organisms. That's why you use ammonium nitrate as a fertilizer on, uh, on many crops. Uh, in the lower left of the left-hand picture, you see a number of these other, other calithrix filaments, but they're deeply embedded in the rock matrix, so you only see the very tip of the filament sticking out. The fact that they're deeply embedded in the meteorite rock matrix is absolute clear and convincing proof these are not modern biological contaminants, although they are clearly biological. This is a, a filament of, uh, uh, of what appears to be formidium with escaped hormogonia, and it's in a, a cyanobacterial mat. Dermocarpella is, uh, uh, is in Chemia siphon hemispherica, uh, are shown in this picture. Uh, it's a hemispherical 
type of cyanobacteria, which is in the state of replication by biocyte formation. Uh, there's only a very, very few cyanobacteria that reproduce in this way in which they make hemispheres. And each one is made, it gets smaller and smaller. Okay. Here is a filament in the orgay meteorite. Uh, and the lower right is the filament uh, with a sheath uh, uh, in living form of Microcoleus thonoplastes. A mat in, uh, in uh, uh, the orgay meteorite. Uh, this is uh, pleuro uh, uh, pleurocapsa. These are baocytes uh, forming. Uh, and those are, those are also very rare cyanobacteria. I've found only a few of them in the orgay meteorite. This is an emergent trichome uh, from a, uh, a filament of lingvia in the cyanobacteria, in the, uh, uh, the orgay meteorite. And these are very special. These are fimbriae, which are attachment structures, these tiny little fibrils. And I'll show you a uh, enlargement here. That's the 200 nanometer bar at the bottom. So those, those fimbriae are about 30 to 40 nanometers in diameter. And, and in fact, uh, you usually, well, in fact, you just do not see them standing up in free space like that. Uh, they're always stuck down in the exopolysaccharide. And when I showed these to Rosemary Ripka Erdman, the world famous cyanobacteriologist, she was shocked. She said she had never seen fimbriae that looked like that because they were always stuck down and she could only see them in TEM instead of SEM images. My hypothesis is that these cyanobacteria were living in a pool of water on the inside of a comet and a fracture occurred in the crust and the water immediately evaporated while these were still sticking up in free space and they then freeze dried in that configuration and ultimately converted to kerogen and that's what we're seeing in the meteorite. And this shows the uh, uh, filament uh, in, in uh, uh, carbonaceous meteorite in orgay, and the carbon oxygen ratio is very, very anomalous, which indicates that these have, have converted to bituminous coal. Yeah. And in this case, the uh, carbon oxygen ratio is even greater. Uh, you've got carbon 92% uh, and oxygen 9.2%. So this is similar to what you find in, in very advanced states of kerogen formation or anthracite coal. In, in 2017 and Dubna, we discovered these diatoms in the Orgay meteorite in the upper left. The lower right is Pinularia sigariana from New Zealand. Uh, those two in the upper left are uh, Pinularia that have just reproduced. Uh, the bottom cell is a little bit smaller than the top one, meaning the bottom is the daughter cell and the top one is the parent. Uh, this particular uh, kind of cyanobacteria uh, is very definitively recognizable and it was possible to to do a, a very sharp uh, identification of, of the parameters like the length and the number of striae within 10 microns, which matches it nicely to Penularia sigariana. This is another diatom in Orgay, another diatom in Orgay, and a fragment here and one hidden behind, behind a rock, uh, which is, is embedded in. These are strange. We have no idea what they are. They look biological, uh, but I'm not certain of that. Although uh, when we look at them in chemical composition, it's most interesting. In the lower right, you see a visible light picture and the brown to, to black color is, is readily recognizable, indicating they're, they're converted to coal-like kerogen. But where it gets most interesting is when we do 2E X-ray map. And if you see in this map, the one immediately to the right of the electron microscope image is carbon, and it shows nicely in carbon. Nitrogen, you just have one little structure showing in nitrogen, but in the in the middle left image is a map in fluorine. It has an enormous quantity of fluorine. And next to that is the map in chlorine. And the major filament has virtually no, no fluorine, but a huge quantity of chlorine that is missing in the one on the left. Well, the 
fluorine and chlorine concentration gets up to the order of 30 to 35 percent. That's impossible. Nothing alive has 35 percent fluorine. It just isn't isn't ever ever seen in any life form on Earth. I showed these to uh, a number of scientists at the uh, Komarov Botanical Institute in St. Petersburg and asked the director, there were experts in dinoflagellates and radiolaria and all kinds of aquatic organisms there. And I asked the director what kind of organism this was and his response was something biological. And I asked him what do you, if he could give me group or genus or species, he said, I think it's something biological. So we have in the meteorites forms that appear to be biological, but do not look like any forms at this point in time that are known on Earth. So this is a true alien life form. In 2012, on the 29th of December at 6.30, there was a giant fireball that was seen in a northeast to southwest trajectory over the Polonarua district of north central Sri Lanka. Many of these stones were seen to fall out of the sky. In fact, the gentleman on the left is Tikiti Banda, and I met with him. That's my GPS sitting by the side of this stone that you see on the right, which is a beautiful piece of the meteorite with fusion encrusting. Uh, you can see cracks and fractures in the fusion the fusion crust. Uh, Takiti Banda said he was standing in his rice field that evening and he saw a big fireball and heard an explosion and then fireflies started twinkling out of the sky and landing around him. Uh, he was seeing things that would fall and turn from bright to dark and bright to dark and I think what he was seeing was the the explosion had broken off a big chunk of outer crust and the outermost crust was molten because it had come through the atmosphere just like an Apollo command module or a space shuttle. When the space shuttle comes in to land or when the command module comes back from the moon, the bottom of it reaches temperatures of the order of 5,000 degrees and it glows and is very, very bright. But then after it goes through the atmosphere and cools, uh, by the time it lands, uh, it's no longer glowing. But I assure you, if you went up and put your hand on a space shuttle tile at the bottom of the shuttle, right after it landed, you would not like that. In fact, the Kitty Banda had the same experience. He reached down and picked up a freshly fallen Polonarua meteorite and dropped it immediately because it burned his hand. Uh, he went to the hospital and there was another lady that had passed out and uh, she went to the hospital as well. Uh, the, this is in, in his rice field in Aralaganwila. Well, the Polonarua stones are very low density, 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8, and they contain unusual minerals, uh, potassium rich silicates and, and deformed uh, olivines. And in the middle picture, you see a highly fractured ilmenite grain in the middle and right picture. Uh, those have many, many breaks, even though they're small grains and they're, they're in the presence of maskelonite. Maskelonite, Wadsleyite, and, uh, and these cracked uh, mineral grains imply shock pressures of the order of 20 billion times the pressure of the atmosphere at the surface of the Earth. 20 gigapascals. Well, 20 gigapascals would not be expected to be found on a rock lying in a rice paddy field in Aralaganwila. 20 gigapascals would be expected to be found in rocks 20 to 30 kilometers down in the crust of the earth or in rocks that had collided with other rocks in space when asteroids smash into asteroids or asteroids and comets smash together. So this is a mineralogical evidence that these are indeed meteorites. The oxygen isotopes were measured by Andreas Pack uh, in, uh, in Germany and Aizo Nakamura in Japan, two of the most brilliant uh, people in terms of the analysis of, uh, of oxygen isotopes. And they both got values of the order of minus uh, 0.335, minus 0.328. Uh, those are far away from the 0.0, .0 of the terrestrial fractionation line. And that is another very strong indication that this, these stones are not terrestrial rocks, but are indeed extraterrestrial meteorites. The other indication is that they have density less than one. 
There are only two rocks on earth that will float on, uh, on water. One is pumice and the other is diatomite. These stones contain very interesting rare earth elements, uh, heavy metals. Here you see in the middle a, a, a gadolinium picture and, uh, and yttrium uh, 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 and the oxygen case series uh, in the top center of this uh, of this form that's this piece of mineral uh, it isn't biological i don't think at all one on the far right is definitely biological that is a big beautiful long curved diatom <clears throat> we did neutron activation analysis and measured the uh, content of potassium 40 uh, <clears throat> uranium 235 and thorium 232 and those levels in the in the Polymerua stones are dramatically higher than what you find in any of the CI or CM carbonaceous meteorites. We find bizarre things in Polymerua as well. This may be a stratosphere, but it has huge spines. The scale bar in the middle there is 100 microns, and those spines stretch out for about 150 microns, and they're like a needle, but they didn't break, which is astonishing to find that kind of a microfossil in that degree, degree of perfection. We find bizarre things that are absolutely unknown. <clears throat> Another, which may be acrotarchs, but we're not sure. These, I'm pretty sure, are diatoms, and I, I'm quite confident that the genus is Alicocera and the species Ambigua. In the lower right is the terrestrial Alicocera Ambigua. Uh, the top two images are from the Polar stone, and the lower left is a pinnate from the Polonarua stone. More pinnates from Polonarua. More. Others, they, these are very similar to this uh, diatom that was discovered by uh, scientists in Russia many years ago. Um, it's a, a Nabicula trophocatrixoides. And these are exotic diatoms in the Aralagan Willa. This one with square uh, square apertures. Ah, this is where I really love it. This is from a week and a half ago. This is Nietzsche in Aralagan Willa. And you see this enormous number of diatoms lying side by side by side. It's just beautiful. And what I've discovered is that we're looking at tube dwelling diatoms in Aralagan Willa. The upper left image you can see the wall of the tube with a, a diatom of large pinnate, possibly a, 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 a pinnularia like we found in, in Orgay. But there are all of these other little pinnates like naviculoid forms uh, down to the lower right of it. And it's in this tube and we can see the wall of the tube, but this was freshly fractured in the meteorite. So the tube actually goes down into the stone itself. And how that happened, I am not certain. Uh, I'm right now working on the theory that perhaps the pollen or the diatoms actually, we know they make a, uh, an exopolysaccharide, which is what they make their tubes out of, but perhaps they're using that exopolysaccharide as a way of, uh, uh, of appropriate enzymes to dissolve the silica of the rock itself. There are a couple of papers that suggest that might be possible. And here's one where you see the wall of the tube. There are some diatoms up at the top as well. Uh, asteroid uh, uh, Bennu was studied by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. And it's intriguing that uh, it contains this boulder seen in the uh, upper right, which is Gorgoyle Saxum, which has very high porosity. In fact, its porosity is 70 to 80 percent, similar to the 80 to 90 percent of Polonarua. Its density is about 0.7 to 0.8, consistent with what we find on Polonarua. Uh, Rositas, who wrote the article about asteroid uh, Bennu, said the weaker boulder type is probably would not survive atmospheric entry, and this may not be rep and thus may not be represented by the meteorites in our collection. However, uh, we promised saying it all did a study of these stones back in 2013 and we're able to show by mathematical calculations that they would indeed have sufficient strength to survive transit through the atmosphere. Very similar in appearance, but much smaller in size to the uh, Gargoyle Saxum is 
our Lagan Villa sample A7, which was the one that I've been studying, uh, uh, and it has density of 0.6 uh, gram per cubic centimeter. Uh, there is another transplanetary uh, uh, extrasolar planet, and that is that came uh, extrasolar comet Oumuamua that came through our solar system quite recently. Uh, it was uh, near Captain Star, uh, which is an M1 subdwarf, uh, and Captain B was formed uh, 11 uh, billion years ago. So that means it would have been quite old at the time that the solar system was formed. <clears throat> this is interstellar comet 2i Borisov, and, and the center uh, image shows the trajectory of 2i Borisov uh, in yellow, and the red line is uh, Oumuamua. Well, these are both coming in through out from far outside of the plane of the ecliptic, which absolute proof that these are not part of our own solar system, and they came swooping in and then left. Uh, but if one of them had been had collided with a planet like Earth, it could have delivered extraterrestrial biology if it contained life forms. Uh, Tommy Gold was one of the first pioneers of, of uh, rocks in the deep crust of the Earth, uh, and and these these rocks are uh, uh, are capable of producing heat uh, by serpentinization. Uh, and also the Kola Super Deep Borehole found that there were rocks that contained heat producing elements and all the way to the bottom at about seven, uh, uh, about uh, uh, 7.6 miles, they found water, they found evidence of biology and, and they found heat producing elements. Uh, it is an interesting possibility that heat producing elements are possibly responsible for water in deep rocks by, by uh, as they decay, releasing uh, hydrogen, and uh, the uh, ener energetic uh, particles and photons coming out could do photolysis of silicate rocks and release oxygen. And with hydrogen and oxygen, you have water. And so, these these stones may give indication of what is supporting the enormous biosphere in the deep crustal rocks. And it's been known for many years now that the crust of the earth supports a very large and very complex biosphere. Uh, and as a result of that knowledge, we know that you don't need liquid water oceans and you don't need atmospheres in order for there to be life. You could absolutely have life deep within the crust of the moon. Uh, the, we know that also from the anti-neutrino map of the Earth. Won't go into that. Uh, basically, extraterrestrial biospheres are a distinct possibility. In fact, I would say not a possibility, but a certainty. I do not believe that the hypothesis that life exists on the planet Earth and virtually everywhere on Earth, but only on Earth, makes any sense at all. If that turned out to be the case, it would be more astonishing than discovering that the planet Earth is at the very center of the universe and every moon, planet, star, and galaxy revolves around Earth. Well, that was a widely accepted paradigm for a long, long period of time, and then they came up with epicycles to try to explain the retrograde motion of planets until finally somebody to the name of Copernicus came along and said, well, no, this isn't the way things work, and that caused a colossal paradigm shift. The reason that it is widely believed that life exists on Earth, but we don't have any evidence of it elsewhere, is because it violates the currently accepted paradigm, because it ultimately implies that panspermia may be a mechanism whereby life arrived on Earth. <laughs> but planspermia could explain the rapid appearance of complex life on Earth and it dramatically alters the time period available for prebiotic biochemistry, molecular and cellular evolution. It, and there is, there is a possible mechanism for the distribution of intact biospheres living in with organisms living in ice or deep crustal rocks. Uh, they are carried by rogue planets or interstellar comets or exomoons. 
and the oceans within the icy crust of those planets could be kept between insulating ice and heated by long-living heat-producing elements. Potassium-40 has a half-life of 1.2 billion years, uranium-238, 4.5 billion, and thorium-232's half-life is 14.2 billion years. And so that is sufficient half-lives that you could actually have transport of biospheres from one galaxy to another. The oldest nearby star, HD 140283, is of the order of 14.5 billion years, plus or minus 0.8. That's really a bit embarrassing because the current Big Bang Theory says that the age of the universe is 13.8 billion. And so it's not nice to have a 14.5 billion year old star. Uh, and it's only 186 light years from Earth. Uh, the escape velocity of a planet or comet is typically 20 to 30 kilometers per second. So the transit time from HD 14283 would be only a few million years. What we know from the work that we've done in Siberia, pioneered by David Gilichinsky of the uh, Institute for Soil Science and Photosynthesis in, uh, in, in uh, Russia, uh, that life can survive in Siberian permafrost and polar ice. He found life in the Beacon Valley ice, which is over 8.3 million years old. And in fact, there's a paper that came out just the other day from a Japanese scientist arguing that he had found life in, in two billion year old rocks. Well, we actually did uh, studies of, uh, and found life in sylvite crystals that we published in SPIE in 2013, I think it was. And, and these are about 380 million year old rocks. And yet they contain living bacterial cells that we were able to, to propagate and grow. Uh, life in deep oceans and deep hot rocks of Earth have survived for over 4 billion years. And the intergalactic transfer of intact biospheres by rogue planets and deep oceans heated by HPEs and serpentinization uh, of the ultramathic rocks is feasible. And the biology within these, these rogue planets or comets would be shielded by, uh, from solar wind, gamma rays, and high energy cosmic rays, which provides an entirely exciting new mechanism for panspermia that does not uh, hold any dangers of uh, damage due to radio radiation. The evidence of biogenicity in the microfossils is that the fossils are mineralized and in a narrow range of known sizes of cyanobacteria, sulfur bacteria, and they have the precise and undeniable morphologies of complex biological shells of diatoms. The cell walls, spines, and fimbriae are present, septa, intact frustules. There's evidence of locomotion, evidence of replication. Uh, the, 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 there is also ecologically consistent assemblages, the kind of communities that are found in the meteorites are similar to what you get in cryokonite communities in Antarctica, in geysers and in uh, deep crustal rocks and tube dwelling, uh, uh, tube dwelling bacteria. Uh, Calithrix, Microcolius thonoplastes, Formidium frigidum, uh, and many of these other diatoms of the genera uh, Nitsia, Navicula, have been found in the in the rocks as well as Alicocera, and they are definitely re recognizable and quite consistent with known terrestrial diatoms. <clears throat> the problems with the current origin of life models suggest that life on Earth may have been delivered to the early Earth rather than originating on Earth. Life conditions, water, energy, and biogenic elements coexist on all comets, planets, and moons of the solar system. The absence of nitrogen proves that the cyanobacteria and diatoms in the meteorites are ancient and indigenous fossil remains. Therefore, extraterrestrial life exists. Life on Earth may have formed on comets, exoplanets, or icy moons more ancient than our solar system and then been transported to Earth by interstellar comets, icy moons, or rogue planets ejected from nearby stars, distant stars, or even galaxies. In summary, the collect complexity of biomolecules, genomes, and metabolic pathways establish conclusively simple cells simply do not exist. The evidence of the antiquity of life 
seems to invalidate the paradigm of the endogenous origin of life on Earth. The presence of two dwelling diatoms in, in the Polonarua, Aralog, and Willis stones is most interesting because most of the tube dwelling diatoms that I've been able to get information on are from polar regions, uh, from the, the southern Patagonia off the coast of Argentina, or from Sweden, uh, in, in, and many of them are found under, growing underneath uh, sea ice. Uh, and, and the presence of potassium and sodium and chlorine in the analysis we did of the diatoms that we discovered in the last two weeks in, in uh, Aralog and Willis zones indicates the presence of seawater. So these appear to be marine uh, diatoms in growing in tubes, lying on rocks on the top of the mountain in north central Sri Lanka in a rice field. And rice farmers don't like salt in their rice fields. But apparently, these were from a salty uh, aquatic environment. Indigenous fossils of cyanobacteria and diatoms in the Polonarua and Orgae meteorites support the Hoyle-Wichromacing panspermia hypothesis. And in acknowledgement, I thank Chandra Wichromacing, Daryl Wallace, and Jamie Wallace at the Buckingham Center of Astrobiology, Anil Saranyaki, and Kirthi Wikramatha of the Medical Research Institute in Sri Lanka, who first sent me the samples of, uh, of Polonarua uh, that I've been studying now since 2012, I've worked with for many years on the SEM analysis. Tube dwelling diatoms are intriguing because I first found tube dwelling diatoms when I studied the, the Henri van Herck collection in Antwerp, uh, Belgium. And I've taken a number of photographs, SEMs of tube dwelling diatoms that were a part of that collection. These actually build these exopolysaccharide tubes, probably to protect them from predators, but uh, also the, uh, it provides them with a nice, comfortable place to live and, uh, and be out of danger. And there I'm showing a, one of the tube dwelling diatoms tubes in the electron microscope image that was taken last Monday of this week, uh, along with the 2D X-ray maps and the spectral data. And with that, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Richard, for the outstanding lecture. And I believe like it's almost like a movie, a journey into the space. <laughs> Uh, with the professor Richard Hoover. I believe like every audience in here, they have been truly enjoyed, including me. And I would like to give my gratitude and be highly appreciated from the Aquastronomy IMC Research Unit for the uh, during such an outstanding lecture from the site. But then, this is the time to the Q&A session. Uh, Dear yes, students and the researchers, if you have any kind of question, please uh, raise your hands in the building. I can just invite uh, you for the asking a few couple of uh, questions from the professor. We should, I think, like we are just moving to the uh, end of the today uh, session. So, Richard, you can just imagine how Sri Lankan students and the researchers are, are passionate with the astrobiology and most of your work. I believe like after you arrival here, so we can have a huge discussion with these people. And also like it's a very good uh, news and the good opportunity to most of students and the researchers who are passionate, enthusiasts with the paleontology, microfossils and the astrobiology. So take that uh, chance and uh, we also just hoping to meet each other uh, people in mid of this September. I'd like we will just inform you in the near future and uh, Richard again for today. It's a very outstanding strategic lecture ever I heard which is regarding the astrobiology because of uh, Italian uh, pure references, pure evidences. So I feel like in the near future, we can just sort out most of a geological conflict, uh, which is uh, having like from fossilization. So like uh, again and again, um, I thank you very much for having me here. And also like, I would like to thank like uh, your colleagues, Bill and the Bray, <laughs> also just uh, here on today. And thank you very much for the, all the students who are asking the questions at the day webinar. 
I would like to say thank you and uh, and uh, tell you that I'm very much looking forward to meeting you in person and and meeting many of these wonderful students uh, and and seeing some of the treasures of Sri Lanka because I've looked at your geology paper that you sent and and it's full of wonderful photographs of some really spectacular areas. So I'm very much looking forward to visiting Sri Lanka again. Last time I was there, I didn't get to see much except the, the rocks in the field, which were what I was excited about. But this time I, I want to maybe get a chance to see something like elephants or leopards or something like that and, and some of these magnificent <laughs> geological formations. So thank you very Definitely. much and I've enjoyed the, enjoyed thank the morning. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Dear students, good night.